Let me just begin by saying up front, when I, I know that I'm uh, going to be talking about temptation, hopefully this is uh, some of the sermons, we want them to be healing sermons. I know every sermon should draw us close to the pre very presence of God. But there's one thing that I know, and that is that all of us deal with temptation. There's nobody that, that uh, gets by without having to deal with temptation. It is common with all. We all deal with sin. We all deal with shortcomings. We all have faulty perceptions. We look at things one way, and in reality, that, that's not the way that it is, though we think it is. And I, uh, Wednesday night, I was preaching on uh, the church in Smyrna from uh, Revelation chapter 2. And in that particular uh, word from God for that church, one phrase in there, we say, he said to the church at Smyrna, I know the things that you're having to go through, and he said, I know that there are those who say they are Jews, but they're not. They are part of the synagogue of Satan. And that's strong language. But really what he was saying was there are some people there who think that they've gotten things figured out. They think that they're Jews. They think they're right on line. But the reality is, is that they're not. They're followers of Satan. That's a strong language when you say the synagogue of Satan. Now you may say, that, why so strong? I mean, this is the same group of people who, who were trying to find fault in Jesus, trying to trip him up, who yelled, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, and were tickled to death when, when they killed him in the most cruel way of death you could ever imagine. How could someone be so wrong but think that they're so right? Sin, the book of James tell us, tells us, to know to do right and not to do it to him it is sin. We've all sinned. No, 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 let me say it this way. We all continuously sin. And we have a God. If He is your Savior and Lord, there's nothing you can do to keep Him from loving you. Whether you sin or whether you don't sin, He loves you. He loves you before you sin. He has covered you with the blood of Jesus Christ. He loves you after you have sinned. All those things are good. All those things are glorious. All those things are wonderful. But He's calling us to Himself. How many of you know that you're never going to be perfect? But we must strive to be. Now when we mess up, we learn from it, we repent of it, we, we seek God the, the best that God would have for us. But we're going to mess up. But we must. Don't accept it. Don't accept sins. We do too much of that. Be open to what it is that God could be doing in your life. If you have your Bibles, turn them to Matthew chapter 4 and stand with me in honor of reading God's Word. I was going to begin today with the, three, the first of the three temptations that Jesus endured in Matthew 4. And, and Monday, I was looking at it, and I got my notes out, and you wouldn't believe how many pages of notes I had on, on verse number 1. My, my introduction would have been longer than my sermon. So for your benefit, and I should get an amen here, for your benefit, all I'm doing today is preaching my introduction. Yeah, that's right. Matthew chapter number 4, verse number 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan, to be tempted by the devil, the adversary, the accuser of the brethren. Let me read one little part of verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterwards he was hungry. Now, I don't want to get into the first temptation that we'll look at next week, but let me just talk to you. 40 days, 40 nights of what he had to go through before the battle even began. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I love you and I praise you and I thank you for uh, all the blessings of life. Jesus, if we didn't know you, we would be wandering around thinking that we had everything right and good. We would be judging ourselves by the way that the world judges us. And that can be very accommodating. But Lord, today we come before you, laid bare. You know everything about us. 
You know the gifts that you've given us, the blessings of life, but you also know the weaknesses that we have that we choose that do not bring honor and glory to you and do not bring blessings to us. So Lord, uh, we come asking you to do a Jesus work. Holy Spirit, have freedom to speak. Amplify your word. Let it come and hit the right place in our heart because Lord, what we want is to be the people that you want us to be to enjoy the life that you've given us to enjoy. It's a good life. It's a blessed life. We just make a mess out of it from time to time. So Lord, may today be a a great day in Jesus. We thank you for all that you've given us. We celebrate our moms, the gifts that you gave us. And Lord, my Father, you are our God and our Father that watches over us. We love you so very, very much. Be with us and help us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. The last series that we went through, we talked a lot about having the mind of Christ. We talked a lot about what it meant to think like he thought. And we said the mind was made up of three things, thinking, feeling, and choices. That means everything that this brain that we have, everything that it does, regulates to those three things. We think, we see, we all those things, that perceptions that we have that come down, and we think, and then it stirs up a feeling within us, and then we make a choice based upon that. So we're all thinking, we're all feeling, and we're all choosing. And then in that realm, God wants us to think God thoughts, to feel the blessings that he has for us, and to choose the good that he has planned for us forever. Satan wants to come in with the opposite. He wants to cloud our thinking. As Zig Ziglar used to say years ago, he wants to give us stinking thinking. And he wants us to have thoughts that uh, are feelings that are about us and about what we think and what we want and what we lust for and what we desire, what we crave. And then the choices come between what is best and what we think is best in that moment that's really not best. So one is good and one is an allurement to do something that is opposite of that. So look what it says In chapter 4, verse 1, it begins with that transitional statement, then. Then. So to to know what we're talking about, we've got to talk about what happened in chapter number 3 that we we talked about already. That was when uh, it's introduced where John the Baptist would come, and he was the preacher of the goodness of God. He was proclaiming the righteousness of God. He was out in the wilderness. God was bringing people to him, and they were being baptized for the repentance of their sin. John was was getting it ready for everybody to look at their life and say, there are things in my life that I know that are wrong. Can y'all say amen? And I repent of it because I no longer want that in my life. So he was baptizing them to repentance, which means showing the death of, burial, and resurrection. It shows that you want to die to sin and raise to walk in newness of life. Then we came to that place where we saw Jesus come to John the Baptist. And he wanted to be baptized, not because he had sinned, but it was the picture of his ministry that God gave him that he was going to fulfill to deal with our sins. So it's the picture of going under It's the picture of submitting yourself to. It's the picture of this may be best for me, but I'm submitting to something else. I die to what I want to fulfill the mission that God has for me, the death and the burial, but raised to walk in newness of life. This is what he would do on the cross of Calvary for us. And at the beginning of his ministry, he was submitting himself to it. At that high point, when Jesus was baptized, The heavens were opened. The Holy Spirit came down and sat upon him. And the voice of God was heard. This is my son. 
in whom I'm well pleased. God could not look at that circumstance and not amen it. He wanted everybody to know that this is his child that he's proud of, fulfilling his mission. You know, I just want you to know today, though you may have sinned, and we have, though you may have really goofed up, and my goodness, we do it way too much, I just want you to know that there is a God that's sitting on the throne in heaven that is your greatest fan, who knows everything about you but loves you completely. There's nothing that you can do to separate yourself from the love of God. God's love is greater than your sin. God didn't come to make us feel dirty. He came to make us clean. God didn't come to remind us that we have no future. God came to be our future. We need to understand and accept that so very much. It says here, then Jesus was led by the Spirit. That means that there are going to be times that it's God's will that you go into a place, listen to me now, of temptation. Now, God's not going to tempt you. God can't. James tells us God can't tempt you. But he can allow testing. Tempting is trying to get you to do wrong. Testing just shows what's already there. If you go through a test and you make an A plus on it, you've done well. But if you've gone through a test and you made a C on it, well, you know some things, but there's some things that you need improvement on in your life. And I don't know about y'all, but there's some areas in my life that I have made an A for in the past, but I have flunked since then. And he, did any of y'all ever have a teacher that when you flunked it, they made you take the test again? And you're like, just pass me and let me go on. No, no, no. We want to make sure that you learn this. And there are some things that we have learned that we've forgotten. So we're all going to be led by the Spirit. Come on. God knows where we've, he knows where we've been. He knows where we are, but he also knows where we're going. And he's very good at taking us from where we are to where we need to be. So sometimes God's going to allow us to go through things that are difficult because there are some cho choices we're not going to make otherwise. He was led by the Spirit. The Spirit never does anything wrong. That means if you're going through something, God has looked at it. God has allowed it. We'll talk about this more next week, 1 Corinthians 10. He's not going to allow more to come to you than what you're able to bear. Y'all listen to me. Does anybody know what a sieve is? You put something in it, and you, a sieve will, will, will keep things from it, and other stuff can go through. There's a lot of things that Satan would like to do to us. And God's going to say, no, 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 no. So before it comes to you, it has to come through his hands. He'll strain out. Y'all, Ladies, y'all use a colander. I mean, it's there and it's got all this stuff in it. And you pour it through the colander. And some will come through and some will stay. Listen. God knows limits that are there, and he's going to help you. He's going to bless you, and the Spirit will use these areas in your life. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, dark places, places you don't want to be, barren places, dry places, places where you will be alone. Places where you're going to wonder that, why is it that I'm having to go through this? Shouldn't I, I deserve more? Why do I have to go through this wilderness? Why is it that people have to go through certain things in life? Mark was talking about his mom passing away at 57. Why couldn't she live to 67 or 77? She would have loved to see April, you know, and just a, to see the woman that she's become. But yet God had another plan 
in that place. Why is it that we have to go through things? There's some wilderness times of things that we have to go through. Let me just, I don't want to delve into this too much, but let me just tell you that while you're in a circumstance, a hardship, a difficulty, a temptation, when you're in the wilderness, stop and look for God. I, I was in a seminary class with about, I don't know, it was over 100 people in there. We were all in the same class, huge class. And we had this little lady come in, and she was a godly lady, and she taught the class that day. And she was basically teaching this principle. She said, in whatever circumstance you're going through, stop and look for Jesus. How many of y'all know he's always there? I mean, you may be in a very difficult place, a very hard-pressed place, a very abandoned place, but there's always going to be an oasis there where you can get a fresh drink of water, maybe a little shade from the sun, Maybe a little time out. 40 days and 40 nights, he was in the wilderness. Hard, difficult. Just a, a very trying, difficult place. And yet, it was the place that God had Jesus. Hebrews 4 says that he was tempted in all ways, yet without sin. You see, there's a battle that's being fought here between us and the adversary, the devil. And he, this is the battlefield that it's being played out on. And Jesus was submitting to that battle. He had lowered himself under that to go to war for us. You see, Satan was a creature of God. He had all this giftedness that, that God had given him. All these things that God had done for him. And those things had come to him and he knew them and, and he had started to get his eyes on those things. And he thought he was as good as God. So here's God, and by the way, far and above. So perfect. Always perfect. Always good. And he looked at himself, and by the way, he had not sinned yet. And he said, you know what? I can be like God. And he lifted himself up in pride. And sin entered into his life. Now what we see happening here is, is Satan is going to come against us. And he's going to use all the blessings of life and the things that are good in this world that God has given us. And he wants to put a twist on it. And he wants to... I hope you hear them now. He wants us to be put up as high as God. In certain, I can say it this way, Satan wants us to think of ourselves as God as well. Little G God. We understand there's a great big G God. But in our lives, Satan wants us to consider ourselves as God as well. Take your Bible. Look over in the book of James, chapter number 1. James, chapter number 1. If I can get there. You there, say amen. I'll, I'll wait for you. Look, Satan's offering one thing. God's offering something else. And you've got to decide between the two. Y'all know, uh, have y'all ever read Proverbs chapter 6 and chapter 7 where it's the picture of the woman that is in her tent and she's dressing up with a beautiful dress and the perfumes and the makeup and she's there. And, and what she's looking for is some guy to walk by and go, oh, and in the middle of a second, he's thinking, he's, something is beginning to percolate within him, and he's feeling, and he's got a choice to make. God, let's, Proverbs 6 and 7, God gave us sex. Can we say that word in church? I got y'all's attention now. 
And, and, and like all of God's creation, it is good. I was expecting an amen out of that. I don't know. I missed it here. But there's nothing. You know, look, women are beautiful, and my wife is a perfect example of that, right? And she is God's gift to me, and she gets the bum rap. I'm the, God's gift to her. But there are things that God gave to us that are to be done right and well and, and honor God. They're glorify God. And by the way, it is good. But then Satan knows that. And he's got this other alluring thing over here. And you walk by it and you say, hmm, my, she looks nice. And he tries to make what God made for good tempting to do evil, to allure us away. I've got a word for that, bad trade, bad trade. You may think that that's what you want. You may think that that's what you need. Bad trade, bad trade, bad trade. Look what it says in verse number 12. James chapter number 1, verse number 12. Blessed. That's the picture of the hand of a God being placed upon someone, the powerful, righteous right hand of God, to anoint, to gift, and to bless. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Let me talk about that word endure for just a moment. It's hupomeno. It, it means to remain. It means to abide. It means not to flee. You don't run, but to persevere. It means to hold fast. It means to stay under or behind, endure the temptation. There is a temptation that's going to be for a season. And what you do when the temptation comes up upon you will prove how long that season's going to be. But there's some difficulties in life that you may say, Lord, I just want this to go. And, and I'm here to tell you some Difficulty circumstances that bring these negative feelings to us, some things God will allow for a long time. The Apostle Paul, we are told, had a thorn in the flesh. And he prayed. Now, by the way, this is a guy who could pray and magnificent things could happen. He could actually pray, and, 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 and it, was, it was a testimony of his life. A person who was dead came back to life. I call that a powerful prayer. And he prayed for this multiple times, probably continuously, that this would be taken away. And you know what God said? No. And for the remainder of Paul's ministry, he had to live, he had to live, listen to me now, enduring the temptation. Enduring the hardship. You've got to decide if you're willing, number one, to fight, number two, to surrender to the chief of the army who gives you the weapons to fight the battle. You've got to decide if you like where that temptation leads you, and even if you don't like where it leads you, you've got to learn to follow Christ in that circumstance. I love Hebrews 12 when it said, I don't want to misquote this thing, let me just quote it to you. Hebrews 12 verse 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are sur surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us. King James says, besets us. Lay aside the weight, lay aside that sin that so easily draws you in to ensnare you. It's a trap. It's a bad trade. He says, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, 
the author and finisher of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him, listen to me now, endured the cross. Endured the cross. That was something that Jesus did not have to go through, but yet he submitted himself to. And he submitted himself to God in that circumstance. And I'm grateful because I'm the beneficiary of it. He went through hard time so that I can have blessed time. The hardest thing in all the history of the world is what happened to Jesus. But because of what happened to Jesus, I have victory in Jesus. He fought that battle for me. I mean, Satan lost don't you know that Satan thought he won when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary and they buried him in that tomb? Uh, there was a party going on in hell because he thought, I've got him. No, no, no. No. It was the death knell to his future because it was over and done. Salvation was born. Blessed is the man, not who lives perfectly, not to the one who thinks that they're sinless. Not to the one who thinks that they have all the answers. Blessed is the one who knows that it's temptation and endures it with God. Looking unto Jesus. Looking under what God can do in his life. He says for, in James 1, he said, For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. That's the word Stephanos. If you were in an athletic event and you won the event, they would take the 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 flowering wreath, and they would place it upon your head. And it was a Stephanos. It was a crown. If you endure, you get a crown from God, a crown of blessing. I, I mentioned this Wednesday night. I, I can't give God anything. I'm just me, right? But when I die and I go to heaven, I will go before the judgment seat of Christ. And the only people who go before the judgment seat of Christ are Christians. All the lost people go through the great white throne judgment. That's a different judgment. But at the judgment seat of Christ, they're all Christians. And you're not judged whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. No, no, no. Your, your fate's, your, your name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're going to heaven. But, but he said, you're judged with what you do with your Christianity. What you do with the gifts that you've been given. Are you going to take all the blessings of life and use them for you, or are you going to use them for his glory? By the way, when we submit and we live under Jesus, it's a better way. It's a glorious way. You may see things in this world that you think, I've got to have that. No, that's a dead-end road. That's a dead-end road. Bad trade. Bad, bad, bad trade. So much better that God has for us. You receive a crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. For all the things that I've done, he's going to give me that laurel wreath. He's going to give me the crown of life. And you know what I get to do? The only thing I can give him is take that what he has given to me and lay it down at his feet. What a day that's going to be. When I think of all the blessings that, I, that I, he has given me, but I get to lay them down. Look what he says in verse 13. This is James 1, verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. God doesn't tempt you to do wrong. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away. Drawn away, ensnared. When he is drawn away by his own desires, his own lust, and enticed. Desires or wants what we think that we have to have. Listen to me. And enticed. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about when I say an itch? Y'all ever had an itch? How can a little bitty mosquito bite you? By the way, he wants your blood. And he, he hardly ever gets it. I mean, he may get into it, but I go, and he loses it. So, But that little mosquito bite, does it, don't they itch? My kids would be itching, scratching them, and I'd say, quit that. You're going to make it worse. All that does is make it worse. It makes it itch that much worse, right? And how come the itch is in the place that we can't scratch it? The place that we don't need to scratch it. We can't, get, can't, can't quite get to it. Y'all ever chased a desire 
that you never could quite get, so you chased it and you chased it and you chased it. Success, fame. By the way, it's a scale. It's a moving scale. People think they got to have money. It doesn't buy happiness. Have y'all seen, I, I shouldn't say this. Y'all forgive me. It's in the news. It's nothing. I'm, I'm not telling gossip. Bill and Bill Gates and his wife, dead end, going through divorce. Tell me what money can't buy. I mean, he quit his job with Microsoft just to give money away. He can't give it away fast enough. Got everything. Have y'all seen that house he's got? Oh, my goodness. Evidently, it wasn't enough. The things that we think that we have to have that never fulfill, we're always chasing, but it, it, it entices, but it never brings peace, love, joy into your life. Look what he says here. He said, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived, it, bring, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is fully grown, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of light, lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Folks, this is so good. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we may be a kind of first fruits of his creation. When we get to heaven, you know what we're going to get to enjoy? God's love, God's blessing, God's glory, God's goodness, God's perfection forever and ever. There will never be a moment that you will not see the light of love. Always, always, always. And yet, heaven is not just a place. Heaven is a gift of, of the blessings of knowing God and abiding with God. That means right now, because I know God and because I can seek to abide with Him, I can have heaven now. Heaven is not putting a person in heaven. It's heaven in a person. So you can have the peace of God now. You can know the love of God now. You can have the joy of God now. You can know that everything is right between your heart and God's heart, between my heart and Lynn's heart, between my heart and Mark's heart. Between everyone here, we have an ability to walk in that love. It is good. And Satan is trying everything that he can to take that away from us. So he'll come and tell you that you're a bad person. Yeah, but I'm forgiven. You'll never amount to anything. Well, I'm a child of God. But what you need is this other thing. That's how he got Eve. Oh, you have all these things. You have all these blessings. But you just need this one more thing out there. And when she scratched that itch, oh my goodness, it's been tough for the rest of us. It's a bad trade. It's a bad trade. It cannot be compared to the glory that God has for us. Come on. Let's compare the mind of Albert Einstein with mine. Oh, that's not even close. Amen? That's not even close. That's, that's a huge difference. What about Mount Everest with an anthill? Oh, you can't compare those two. What about a walk to the moon with a walk to the keyboard? I mean, they're both a walk. There's nothing that can be compared. I heard this phrase many years ago, and it's been a blessing to me, and I hope it's a blessing to you. Sin thrills, but then it kills. You think that you're going to be drawn in because that's what you need at that moment. That's what you believe. That's what you want. It's a bad trade. It's a dead end. It's a dead end. But God loves you enough to let you make that choice. If you want to make the bad trade, that's up, up to you. My prayer, what led me into this, this series of sermons that I'm preaching, was I saw what Jesus went to, through 
And I started to correlate. I felt those same desires. And I wanted to learn how to deal with temptation. But I want to tell you, it all begins with an act of the will of your heart. Are you going to get serious with this or not? There are certain things that you're going to deal with for a long time until you finally find the feet of Jesus and lay it down and leave it there. You've got weaknesses and you've got strengths. You've got gifts that you've used in the wrong way. God wants to bless you. You just won't let him. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? One of the things I want us to learn is the joy of forgiveness and the blessings of abiding in Christ. You know why you don't hear too many sermons like this? Because what's popular is telling everybody that you're good, you're great, you're wonderful. Oh, you might have a few shortcomings. You might have a few little picadillos in your life. But, but for the most part, you're just a good person. And we like that. Pat me on the back. Oh, I like it. I'll tell you, you're a good person. I'll tell you, you got great gifts. But if there's any area in my life that is not submitted underneath the will of God, it's a bad trade. It will not bless me. And I'm tired of seeing good people hurt. I'm tired of seeing good people drugged down by their choices when God wants to do so much more for us. So where does it all begin? It all begins with taking a racer to your will and your way and let God rewrite our story.